All right. Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Nazareth and today we have uh, a webinar specifically for students interested in PhD studies for fall 2023 at the University of Florida in any one of the programs that we offer in the Herbert Wertheim College of Engineering. So thank you all for taking time to participate today. We have a full hour dedicated to this. We're gonna go over a lot of information and we're gonna answer uh, any questions that you have. And we have a great group of our um, graduate staff across the departments that are here and some of our current PhD students um, as well. Um, so we've invited two different populations to participate today. And I know some are gonna keep showing up. There's a bunch that are online now and some are running between classes. Uh, so they'll show in at different times. We are recording this session. So tomorrow, Ashley will post the recording on our website along with all of these slides. And I should have sent that link out when I emailed all of you the invite, but I forgot. So in the morning, I will email to everybody again, all of you that are attending, as well as the others that are conflicting with class now and they could not attend. So we have students that are prospects, they're getting ready to graduate from their bachelor's degree program or their master's degree program, but they're all interested in PhD. And then we also have some students online today that have applied already for PhD for spring 2023. So we'll try to go over a lot of information uh, and answer all of the uh, questions that you might have. So I'm gonna uh, pull the slides up here and then I'm gonna uh, start by letting everybody that's on our panel uh, introduce themselves. So um, our associate dean is not here right now, but he might be showing up at any time. He's, uh, I think he's more than double booked. He's triple or quadruple booked with appointments right now. So that's Toshi Nishida, and he's associate dean for academic affairs and a professor of electrical and computer engineering. And things are a little especially busy now because we are nearing the tail end of a dean search. So our dean has been on board for uh, almost 15 years and she's retiring. And so we're getting down to the end, uh, all anxiously waiting to see who the new dean of Herbert Wertheim College of Engineering will be probably for the next 10 years or so. So I direct uh, graduate recruitment. I'm Mike Nazareth, and I've been in touch with all of you, uh, some for a couple years, some maybe as recently as a couple students just signed up today, and I quickly uh, sent them uh, some invites. I know one was from Idaho, where, where I was raised. So, uh, so we welcome to all of you, and we're going to go over a lot of detail. Hi, I'm Ashley. I'm the coordinator for graduate recruitment here. I work with Mike to help set up everything for all of our recruits. I'm Christina Sapp. I work for the CISE department. I do the graduate admissions for masters and PhDs. My name is Julissa Nunez. I work in the electrical and computer engineering department and I'm the admissions officer for the department. Hello, my name is Paula Jones. I am the academic program specialist for SE, the Engineering School Sustainable Envi Infrastructure and Environment, which houses civil and coastal engineering and environmental engineering sciences. Hello, my name is Tahira Franklin. I'm an academic advisor for material science and engineering and nuclear engineering. Hi, my name is Megan McMahon. I am the graduate recruitment and admissions specialist for mechanical and aerospace. All right. Hey, everyone. My name is Stephen Lanton. I'm a PhD student in the agricultural and biological engineering department. Uh, I'm also the engineering graduate student council chair. Hello, everyone. My name is Han Ting Zhao and from the chemical engineering department. And uh, I work for our uh, student, uh, department, student union as a recruitment chair. So if you have some question about our department for the recruitment, you can ask me. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Min Cho. I'm a fourth year PhD student in mechanical engineering. Um, I'm serving as the vice chair of the engineering graduate student council. Thank you. 
Okay, so you can see that we have a great group of staff and current PhD students here to provide you information and answer all your questions today. So we want to make the best use of your time. So I will be presenting slides and going over some detailed information. I will ask some of our panelists to comment for their department on specifics, but I want you all to feel free to start your questions now. You don't have to wait. So in the Q&A section uh, online here for the webinar, feel free to ask questions. And now that you've seen all of the panelists, you can ask specific questions to specific individuals or specific departments. So you can be getting the, uh, the best of your time here uh, during our webinar today. And again, if you just joined us, we will be posting this recording and the slides tomorrow. And I will email everybody again all of you that are attending and those that could not attend because of classes so that you will have that. Okay, so, but before we get started, we love to give things away. So Ashley. Hi, so we're gonna be giving away some t-shirts. Um, if I call out your name, if you just wanna go into the chat and change it to where it sends to just me. If you'll send me your address, I can mail those out to you. Um, we're gonna do one for John Plummer, uh, Chris McNabb, Rachel Beal, Joseph Coffey, Caitlin Southern, Jeremy Hall, and Ryan Johnson. All right, you're the lucky winners of the Florida t-shirt giveaway. So follow Ashley's instructions. She also needs your shirt size. So let her know men's or women's and the size and your address. And we'll get those in the mail, uh, hopefully by tomorrow. So congratulations. And maybe we'll give a few more away at the very end. So we can have uh, people listen to all the information. Okay, so we'll start off with a broad overview about University of Florida. We are one of the largest uh, universities in the entire United States. We have over 57,000 students. That's bigger than some towns. I know for some of you where you're located right now, uh, we're, uh, we've been around a long time, well over 100 years or 150 years. We have lots of graduate students as well. Almost a third of University of Florida is graduate students. So it's not just for undergraduate students. We care deeply about PhD students, master students, professional students. So you'd have lots of students to connect with while you're here. We surpassed the $1 billion mark in this last cycle. And that's incredibly important to PhD students because the research dollars and expenditures that we receive on grants and our faculty that pays for our labs, that pays for our PhD students, that pays for you to be here, pays your tuition, pays your stipends, et cetera. And of course, we're located in Florida, so we, not, we don't just have all the oceans around us, we have several lakes. We have Lake Alice right on campus and Lake Wahlberg, which is a short bus right away. And there's lots of activities of those, all free for our students and our employees and any friends or family of them. So specifically today, we're talking about the Herbert Wertheim College of Engineering. This is also one of the largest colleges of engineering in the entire United States. So 10,658 students, that number, I just looked that up three or four weeks ago for fall enrollment, and that's how many that are here right now. Of those, almost 3,400 are graduate engineering students. So again, there's a big focus on graduate at our university and um, here in the Herbert Wertheim College of Engineering. We have lots and lots of faculty and we're always hiring new faculty and virtually all departments or degree programs that exist in engineering do exist here at University of Florida. We are very, very proud of our rankings. Um, probably about 20 years ago, we were ranked 30th or beyond. And the goal was we really want to get into the top 20. We want to be a top 20 institution. And that became a reality in 2014. And then uh, the next day, the goal was we want to become a top 10 ranked institution. And that took a few more years. But by 2018, we were ranked number nine. And then the very next hour, I think, with our new president, we wanted to become a top five institution. So 
Last year that was achieved. We're very proud of that. Everybody contributes that to here. Our top students that we bring in, top-notch faculty, top-notch staff, et cetera. And then the rankings came out last month and we maintained and stayed at number five. So it's, we feel it's a really high quality product. These are all of the degrees that are offered. We have uh, many, many areas of specialization. There's probably uh, anywhere from 10 to 20 or 30 of these within each of these areas, but these are the high end what the degree would say uh, for the PhD. So you can see we really uh, span across all disciplines here uh, in the Herbert Wertheim College of Engineering. Our departments are ranked well uh, uh, also. I think this was, we're in 2022, but the rankings always come out a year in advance. I haven't seen the latest ones on this. They could be out. Uh, there are so many that, that spring around, but you'll see that we, we really do well across many, many disciplines. So the product is good at the university level, the college level, and then individual department level um, as well. So, uh, coming with all of our students and our faculty, we have a lot of space and a lot of facilities. There are lots of buildings on campus. I think I last heard there was more than 400 buildings on campus, but you can see there's a large amount that are dedicated to engineering students. Engineering uh, offices, PhD students have offices, faculty have offices, research labs, teaching labs, etc. Um, so we're not just in one section of campus, we're really spread all over campus, so um, you could have classes in many of these different areas. We have some new buildings that I wanted to highlight, and one is the Herbert Wertheim Laboratory for Engineering Excellence. This opened just over two years ago, and this building kind of serves uh, multi-purposes. It's not just for a specific engineering discipline. There are faculty in there across multiple engineering departments that have offices, that have research labs. There are spaces for graduate students and undergraduate students. And it's kind of more of a new age engineering building uh, that really uh, is the best of all worlds uh, for all of our constituents. So that, that's right at the center of campus, right by the DIAG, right by the right student union. And we're excited about that. And then uh, shortly after that was completed, a partnership was announced with NVIDIA and the uh, CEO of NVIDIA, uh, I forget uh, his name, but he's an alumni of uh, University of Florida in engineering. So he made a significant donation uh, in excess of 50 or $70 million. Um, and that's uh, another building that's almost done that I'll show. But we have the Hypergator. And so this will enhance the Hypergator. It's one of the fastest artificial intelligence supercomputers um, in the Southeast and throughout the United States, but now it's gonna be enhanced and it will be one of the fastest ones in the world. And so there are lots of computer science majors, electrical engineering majors, computer engineering majors, but what we're trying to do at Florida is embed AI across every engineering department in some facet. So all of you would be involved in some sort of computing or high powered computing. And we're taking it a step further than that. And we're embedding it in every college on campus. So this is pretty unique. I think a lot of universities have it in some spots, but we're trying to embed it everywhere and be known as the AI uh, university. So part of that uh, large donation from NVIDIA is powering this brand new building. Uh, Malakowski Hall for Data Science and Information Technology. You can see the rendering at the top and the bottom picture, you can see what it looks like. I pulled that picture this morning. So this is scheduled to be open in 2023. So it's really come a long ways. They've been working on it for two years. This will then, the, uh, the um, head of the, the chair department for CISE will move to a floor in this department. Uh, for ECE department will also move here, but then there's multiple floors in this building. So some will be other colleges on campus for that cross collaboration in many different areas. So we're all very excited about um, this one that's coming along uh, actually quite quickly to be done in just about two years um, for the time it takes to, for buildings on campus. And the last rankings that I wanted to point out is uh, diversity. Diversity is very important to, uh, important to us here at University of Florida. It's important to us uh, in the students that we bring in, the students that are enrolled here, bachelor's, master's, PhD. 
it's important to us in the faculty and the staff and, and across many metrics. This is one area that I've kind of looked at over my career, which is uh, actually starting year 30 now. I don't know where the time has gone, but uh, that website below, you can go in there and you can put in any major on a campus and it will kind of rank the top 100 that actually students graduate with that degree. So if you wanna know how many graduate masters in English or a PhD in music, and you can add an ethnicity to it, um, it will spit you out the numbers. And the important thing about this for us is every year we rank in the top 10 or the top 20 in many of these diverse categories. So we don't just show up in one area, um, but we make a concerted effort to do that. And I think that's what helps. So you can check that out as well. So today we're, we're talking about PhD. And so at University of Florida, the average student completes the PhD in five years, some in four and a half, some may take uh, longer than that, um, but the majority is this four and a half to five years. And I think we have about 80 to 85% of our students come straight from the bachelor's degree into the PhD. And that PhD is inclusive of the master's degree. So you would pick up the master's at about the one and a half to two year mark. So the students that are just here for master's and the PhD students, if you're in the same area, let's say biomedical engineering in the same area of specialization, you would be taking the same classes, the master's and the PhD students for this first year and a half or two years. The difference is the PhD student, you have a lot more things to do, right? You have to work on so many hours of research in lab each week. You have commitments that your faculty uh, will require things of you. Uh, maybe they're working on a publication you have to help, et cetera. Um, but that part is similar. If you already have a master's, you're coming in with the master's, most of those students can take one year off of the degree. Uh, but that also depends on the classes you took, the degree you're going into, what's the overlap, was there any content missing, and the departments would have to look at that. But we definitely have students come straight from uh, the master's to the PhD as well. All right, so I want to talk about admissions, and then I'm going to let uh, each of our departments speak about that as well, because there's clearly there's some differences um, across departments. So these are the exact numbers of all the students that applied for PhD admission across all the departments uh, in Herbert Wertheim College of Engineering for fall 2022. So we had about 1,200 applications, and that's actually a little low. We've really been in the uh, 1,500 plus for applications, but I think there was still a little bit of um, COVID overhang, so some of the numbers were a little bit lower. 30%, 31% were admitted. This in the past couple of years has been no higher than 40%. It's usually been in this 30 to 35% range, maybe 36 or 37%. And then we have 156 enrolling. This is also a little bit lower. We'd like to have 200 new PhD students a year. It's about 40% is probably a good average for the ones that are admitted that, that attend. I think some of our numbers are lower this fall, also with some COVID uh, overhang. Uh, some of the international students still were hung up being able to go to their embassies and get visas and all of that was complicated and delayed. So we definitely would have been higher if all of those areas were relieved. That's the average cumulative GPA of the new incoming PhD students for about the last four to five years running, a 3.7 in their undergraduate studies. We definitely see students in the 3.5 plus, and we even see students in the 3.0 plus, maybe someone who didn't do as well at the uh, undergraduate level in the bachelor's degree, but then had a master's and did exceptionally well. Or maybe their undergraduate GPA was a little bit lower, but if you plucked one semester out of that, they had a, a bad semester for a variety of reasons, then it would have been much higher. So um, that's the average, but we, we've seen students um, that are below that uh, as well. So here's some of the overlying things for PhD admissions, but I would like to let our department uh, speak now so I don't uh, take all the time. So um, maybe we can start with uh, Tahara, if you'd like to highlight some areas for those interested in materials or nuclear engineering to apply. 
Hi, hello, my name is Tahir Franklin. Um, we accept applications for fall admissions. Um, like uh, Mike stated, the GRE is way for us and, and the main admission application requirements that you put up on um, for you to see are relevant to our department. Um, I've seen a couple of students ask about funding for material science. So our PhD students are fully funded. They're given a stipend, a tuition waiver, and health insurance. Um, we do not allow self-funded PhD students within our department. And this is for materials and nuclear engineering. Um, we offer research in a variety of areas. Um, for materials, it could be metals, biomaterials, ceramics, the list goes on. For nuclear, it could be plasma infusions, radiochemistry, um, nuclear fuel cycles. Um, but if you have more questions or you would like to speak specifically about our research and which faculty are working on what, um, you can send me an email at advising at msc.ufl.edu and I'd be happy to talk with you. So for all of the uh, domestic students that are online today, so if you're a US citizen or a permanent resident, you should have received a PhD application fee waiver from me so you could apply for free. If you did not, send me an email and I'll get it one to you. For the international students, some of our departments are doing that. So I'll also ask when each department talks if you can mention if you're offering that or not. And maybe um, Tahara, I forget, is MSC doing that? Yes, so we are offering international fee waivers. Students have to um, submit an application for it. We do have an application um, that I can send to you. Um, so if you're interested in getting an application fee waiver, again, email me at advising at msc.ufl.edu. Great, thank you. How about Jalissa for ECE? Hi, everybody. I'm Jalisa. Um, as Tahara said, uh, our GRE is a um, way for our uh, program as well. I wanted to mention that some people will try to send GRE scores to try to get kind of an edge, um, just to let you know we will not be evaluating the GRE at all. And we actually discourage students from sending in the GRE anyway, because if you do happen to fall below a university level requirement, then the GRE will actually work against you. So we would just recommend not sending the GRE at all. Um, the other requirements that are listed there are the same for our program. We require three letters of recommendation and we strongly encourage you to get them from faculty members. Um, it can be from industry uh, employers as well, um, but it's better to, do, um, to use faculty members if possible. Um, and then also just make sure to look at the department websites when you're doing your application before doing your application, because some of the departments may have department specific requirements. So you wanna make sure that you're looking at those first because they will not be mentioned on the general university application. Okay, great. Uh, how about Paula and Essie? Um, yeah, again, everything that you have pretty much listed here is what we require as well. Um, the only thing I don't see is a resume. We do ask for that um, in your application. And we do have some background courses that we ask students to have. Um, so just please review those on our website. Um, we do offer the international PhD waiver that we can send to you directly um, at gradinfo at se.ufl.edu. Um, and if you email that email, I'll send you information about the waiver and also if there's anything missing on your application. I've started to look at, at fall 2023 applications at this time. So if you have any questions about your application after you submit it, just let me know. Okay, great. Thank you. How about uh, Megan and MAE? Um, we are not currently offering any application fee waivers for international applicants, so please keep that in mind. Um, in addition to all of the requirements you see on the screen right now, we do also require a resume. Um, we also would like to highlight the importance of reaching out to faculty early and often so that you can secure those funding offers from faculty in order for us to um, admit your application. So we require funding for all of our students to make sure that you are reaching out and finding those faculty members that you are interested in working with. Okay, great. And for the ones that are not offering the application fee waiver, um, I guess the good news if you're an international student is um, University of Florida is one of the most economical 
admissions application fees in the country, it's only $30. And I know lots and lots of universities, it's 100 or 100 plus. So you can take a little bit of solace in that. All right, how about Christina for CISE? Hi, um, so for our department, we do not offer an international fee waiver. Um, the GRE has been waived for our PhD applicants, so that's new for us, so that's good. For the statement of purpose, one of the things we have, um, I can tell you from, so our faculty, let me backtrack a little bit. So our faculty have applications, they, they're they able to pull. So if you are applying to our department, our faculty have access to that. And I will tell you that they look at your statement of purpose. So on your statement of purpose, if you have, I would state to put in the area of interest that you're um, for the research, and or even their name. So go to our website and you can look at the areas of interest and find their names. And I would put them in your statement of purpose because they will pull your application and, and look at it if you if you put that. Not that they don't look at them all, but I mean it would it intrigues them and stuff. So letters of recommendation, um, we require three um, for that as well. Um, let's see. I wouldn't advise reaching out to the faculty unless you've had interaction with them previously because they will be bombarded with, with emails. Um, so the faculty that are looking for students will review your applications. The ones that aren't won't. So I would not, like I said, I wouldn't advise um, reaching out to them directly. Yeah, that's a good point. So we have lots of faculty, 300 plus here, but they're not all looking for PhD students every year. So um, kind of uh, it's a careful navigation to try to figure out which ones may or may not. Sometimes our graduate staff can help you with that if you reach out to them. Okay, so we have some of our current uh, PhD students here. So I'll let them if they have uh, can talk about PhD admissions or th they applied, they're here, they're enrolled. So I'm sure they have some advice. How about Stephen and ABE? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, I just wanted to let you all know that, you know, you don't really necessarily have to have a really, really stellar GPA um, as long as you have different things that make up for it. You know, for example, I would consider my undergraduate GPA sort of, you know, average, but, you know, I had a lot of extracurriculars and whatnot that made my application a little bit more competitive. So there's there's definitely lots of other things that you can do to um, make up for some of the, you know, potential potential weaknesses in your application. Yeah, that's a great point. So um, if you have even one faculty in a department really interested in you and you've made a connection that way, that could be all you need for them to put down to admit you and fund you and then you're here. And different faculty are looking for different things. They're, they're very diverse as well. All right, um, Han Quinn's joined us today from Chemical Engineering. Would you like to say a few words? Yeah, I'll have a say. So for our de department, so the recruitment rule is quite different from other departments. So the admission, uh, the admission letter will be released by the recruitment committee. So sometimes if you contact a professor that you are that you are interested in, will not that helpful because of the final decision will made by will be made by the uh, recruitment uh, committee. But you can also uh, still contact to your uh, contact to the professor you are interested in, and uh, if the professor uh, interested in you, they will talk to the uh, recruitment committee, and uh, they will and uh, and they can recommend you to the recruitment uh, committee. So you still have chance to get into our department. And for the GRE, and uh, it was uh, it will be uh, waived for this fall. And for and some people said. They don't have a publication when they submit their uh, 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 when they do their application, but that uh, but don't worry about that. So you can talk to your research experience uh, during the application. And uh, for some other technical issue like the uh, application website, you can talk to our secretary in our department, and they can help you solve that. Okay, great, good advice. And Min Chao is here from MAE. Yeah, so I just want to echo on what the other two students had said. Um, I think the um, the statement of purpose is very important uh, and you can stand out if you could 
kind of state the professors that you would like to work with um, so they can pull your application um, uh, when they read the statement. So I think that uh, that's what I did. And I think that's what uh, really helped me get into UF just by stating you know, two or three faculty members that you're interested in working with. And then if the department requires a resume, um, like Stephen mentioned, um, if you don't have like a stellar GPA, uh, I feel like the uh, one of the best ways to stand out with extracurricular would be to polish your resume a little bit to show different things that you have done in undergraduate. Good advice. So another thing I wanted to point out is um, you, some of our students, uh, when they're applying, they want to apply to two departments. So you can certainly do that. And if you have an application fee waiver, it will work for actually as many of your applications as you want to submit. Some students do two. It's, I see five or less that do three a year, and usually nobody does more than that. But some undergraduate majors are uh, lead to several graduate degree programs. You can actually apply to any one of our PhD programs and be in a different engineering department. So for example, if you're undergraduate in mechanical engineering, you don't have to just apply PhD in mechanical engineering. You could apply mechanical and you can also apply biomedical. If you're in chemical engineering undergrad, you could apply nuclear engineering. You could also apply material science engineering or chemical engineering. So uh, the way you would do that is you submit your first application. Once that's submitted, then you go to start a second app Somewhere there's a question on there, and if you answer yes, this is another, a second app, it will pre-populate the first half of your app, and then you change the second half uh, for the second area that you're applying to. If you apply to two different programs, those are two different decisions. Those are two different departments and sets of faculty that are reviewing them. You could get admitted to both, or you could get admitted to one and not the other. And any department that you're admitted to, you then have until April 15th, uh, the national deadline, so it would be April 15, 2023, to accept or decline your admission decision. So you certainly have the option to do that, and we would welcome you to do that if you have interest in multiple areas. So uh, Min Chao was just talking about the statement of purpose. This is really important. Here's some other specifics up here that could be helpful advice for you. So do keep in mind, though, that every year, we have more qualified applicants than we have space for. So we don't have space for faculty to be your mentor for every student. We don't have office space for every student. We don't have research lab space. We don't have funding for every student. So some students don't get admitted that are completely academically qualified, but we can't pick everybody. So this is one of the things that can separate and make you stand out because after a while, Students with high GPAs look the same, and when we have test scores, high test scores look the same, but everybody's statement of purpose is totally different because you write that tailored to you as an individual. So this is really an area uh, to spend some time on and even have some of your friends or faculty ask if they'll read a draft and see what they think of it before you submit your final version. Um, there could be an option for a personal essay, optional, or you could include some of this in a statement of purpose. So I always like to just mention this because some students feel they had a semester that was maybe not up to par of their capabilities or something was going on in their life, so they didn't do as well at a particular time, but they don't feel that's representative of their talents and of their academics. So this would be where you could put a few sentences or a paragraph about that so that um, admission committee would know. And when they get down to the end and maybe there's five slots left for PhD and there's 40 or 50 great applicants and they can only pick five, um, this could be something that could put you or put the student over the top to be selected. You wouldn't be selected because of this, but if all things are even and they ha are you know, nitpicking at the end between great students, it could be something like that that helps to bring us a diverse applicant pool. Letters of recommendation are really important. So um, my main thing on this is I think three, three is the, the, the number because our admissions application actually will allow five to be submitted. But a lot of departments, they receive way too many, uh, they receive a lot of applications, way more than there are faculty and there's not enough time. So they might, they're, they're not gonna read all those if someone's just trying to submit more and more. So stick to three, but do three strong letters of faculty that know you well. So 
Do any of, uh, maybe Stephen, do you have any advice for the students on who they should select or how and when they should ask a faculty for a letter of recommendation? Yeah, so typically, you want to ask early, you know, probably, you know, at least a, at least a couple months before the actual deadline for the letters of rec. Um, and you would ideally want to ask people that really are familiar with your, you know, quality of work. So, um, you know, we we don't really get to know a lot about you if you just submit a letter written by someone who has like a generic letter for you. So maybe your like undergraduate research advisor would be nice. Um, if there is someone you worked with in industry that you know is familiar with their work ethic, um, like a supervisor, that would work well. Um, I also we also got a question in the chat about using um, uh, like a outside research experience. You know, definitely get um, get those principal investigators, especially if they have PhDs. Those letters of recommendation will will weigh a lot. That's some uh, some great advice. So I know you want to know about the money, about the funding, right? That's really important to be a PhD student and be effective and productive and give your best effort. You don't need to be worrying about where all the funds are coming from, right? So these are the basic uh, fellowship packages for our PhD students. And then I'm going to let any of our department uh, graduate staff that want to talk, talk, because this is not representative of all awards. But um, our awards became named Dean's Award, Recruiting Award, and Research Fellowship Award two years ago. They, they change the names every so many years. And they all take care of tuition. So some of you are in-state residents, some of you are out-of-state residents, some of you are international students. If you get these awards, the tuition is covered. It's just waived. So you don't need to worry about what level of tuition is. They're usually four or five years awards and our minimum stipend is $30,000. That's a pretty decent amount to be living in Gainesville, Florida. If you have a roommate, it's a really, really good amount. Um, and so that's an area to compare when you get offers from other schools because another school might say 35 or 36 or 38, but the cost of living might be double to live in Atlanta or Chicago or San Francisco. So look, look at the town, that's important. And then they also give you Gator Grad Care, which is the health insurance. There's no separate application. You fill out the admissions application and you'll be considered for all admission and all fellowship. If we need something else from you, our departments will get a hold of you. So some of our departments are doing a little more than this. Are there any of our department grad staff that would like to add to this about fellowship packages? Okay, so I know that um, some faculty will go up to 32 or even 36. And the deciding factor for that is if they've written for a grant from the federal government or from a foundation and they have more funds to offer, then they can offer you this and supplement that and give you more on top. So I do see some students that, that come in with more than this as well. And there could be some other factors but we have a certain number of those fellowships because those are the those ones go for the full four to five years for your PhD. And then these ones we don't really have a limit on. So any faculty that has research grants can award students fellowships. The main difference from these is that they're usually one year of funding. They're not the guaranteed four or five. But what takes place is Every year at the end, at some point in the year, a PhD student has, um, I forget what it's called. Some of the grad staff helped me. It's the, the contract or the review that they do at the graduate school. Who remembers that, the, your annual review? What's that called? Um, all right, I'm blanking here on that. But basically it's like a performance review that you do each year and you sit down with your faculty mentor and uh, other faculty or people that are on your dissertation committee and they go over um, your performance. So what's going well, what's not going well, what are areas uh, needing for improvement, et cetera. So every year that takes place and as long as a student is doing well and has satisfactory performance towards their degree, then they'll get funding for the next year. So it's not in anybody's best interest to come, go a year or two, and then they're cut off from funding. That, that doesn't really happen. 
So if you get one of these awards, um, it's still a great thing and students are able to use these for the full time until they graduate. We have some other fellowships in Florida. One is called McKnight. Um, I hadn't heard of this when I came to Florida. This is the start of my ninth year here. Before that, I was at University of Michigan. And McKnight is only for students that um, are in Florida public universities. Uh, they enroll at a PhD program at a Florida public university. And they have fellowships and they can provide money for these same categories. Uh, I'm not sure if 26K is still the stipend amount or if that's gone up. Um, so you could, you could be asked to apply for one of these or someone submitted your application, you could be in consideration for one of these as well. If you get one of these, then usually you, they would use this funding for the first couple years until the funds expire, and then the University of Florida Fellowship would kick in after. And if this stipend is less than our 30,000 one, then you'd get supplemented, so that would at least equal up to that. So this is an advantage uh, if you are from another state, which I know a lot of you are, um, for a Florida uh, institution. There's other ones I see students get like Bridge to the Doctorate. This one is more specific with LSAMP programs. These have application um, process that you have to submit. There's websites that has the details on these, but we do have an LSAMP program here and I see students that receive this. And then I see top off. So I know we have a bunch of really talented and bright students online today that are applying for other national fellowships like NSF, SMART, um, DOD, et cetera. So if you get any of these, they'll usually pay for two or three years, all costs, everything. So what we would do for those is we give cash back to the student. And I've seen students get anywhere from 2,500 to 10,000 cash back per year of these national awards. And you just gotta have that. Basically because you are saving us money by bringing your own funds for so many years. And then our fellowship would kick in after. So do know that that, that that is an opportunity if you've applied and received some of these other high level national awards. We also have many research institutes and these are collaborations across departments. So for example, uh, Florida Institute for Cybersecurity, it's got CISE majors in it, it's got ECE majors, it's got nuclear engineering majors, it's got biomedical engineering majors. So it's a chance to do work across many areas and sometimes they can provide some funding too. Um, for our PhD students. So um, also remember to keep asking your questions in the Q&A if you have some, so our staff and students can be answering those throughout. So the next step, your first step is December 5th. So you need to have your application submitted by December 5th. I wouldn't wait till that last day, kind of use that like Thanksgiving break is your last time, but inevitably we'll have lots of applications that come in on the third, fourth and fifth. The application does not turn off on December 5th. It stays open actually until May. So, but what happens is many departments have different uh, priority piles and buckets. And the ones that get in on time are uh, given higher priority and higher consideration than those that wait till later. So I would not turn it in after that. I would turn it in before or by December 5th. So the next thing will happen is we have our spring visit. Our spring visit this year um, is December 23rd to the 26th. We fly in 175 to 200 admitted PhD students. So the departments will start reviewing all of your applications. And of those that are admitted, we send, uh, I will send the invitations out to invite you to this and UF pays all the costs. So it's primarily for domestic students, US citizens or permanent residents that reside in the US, but we are also opening it up this year to international students who reside in the US. We're not flying students in uh, from other countries. There wouldn't be times for visa processing and all of that. But we will have a large cohort and this is our premier recruiting event of the year. We have a bunch, but everybody enjoys this. You get to see the best of all worlds. So let's say we have, 30 students here for biomedical engineering. We get to spend the most of the time with those admitted students with biomedical engineering. Then we also have some big events for everybody that's here. So you'll get to see the University of Florida if you've not been here. You will get to see Herbert Wertheim College of Engineering and most importantly, your department you're admitted to. And then you will get to see the town of Gainesville. We'll have a bus tour, 
you get to see some apartments and things in town. And then most importantly of all, in my mind, you also get to see the cohort. You get to see the other students that are admitted PhD that are thinking about coming here and you'd spend the next five years of your life with them. So it's really the best of all worlds. We book the entire hotel next to campus and it will be packed uh, and it's a great time. So um, I'll send the invitations out. Um, the earliest I've ever sent them out is I've had one or two departments over the years that send me their list of admits right before Christmas break. And I'm sending the invites for this like on December 20th and 21st. No department was able to pull that off last year. Most of them are the first, second, and the third week of January. We try to get them all done a month out. So by January 23rd, and in the invitation, it has our travel agency. You can immediately start booking whatever flight works best for you. If you live closer to campus within a couple hours and you wanna drive, you can do that and we'll um, give you whatever the mileage reimbursement rate is. So, so this is a great time. And I, I really encourage you to come for this for admitted students because you shouldn't go somewhere for five years for a PhD if you haven't visited. So you definitely need to take time to visit. The hardest part about this is I know all of you are applying to multiple universities. So the average student that comes has been admitted to three to five PhD programs, different universities. And some of the visits are the same weekend. It's inevitable. There's only about six or seven or eight weekends then by the end of February to before April 15th. And there's hundreds of schools. So you have to make a choice. And our departments do it one of two ways. One way is you get admission, that's a separate letter. And the other way is you get an admission with funding letter and then come to the visit. The ones that just give you admission, you have to come to the visit so they can meet you and the faculty can meet you because then during that visit, they're deciding which of those to give funding to. So it's really important. If you didn't come to the visit, then they would be like, well, I guess we're not that high of a priority for that student. They have other schools ahead of us. So they would move down the list to someone else for funding. So keep that in mind. We separate those two at Florida. Some departments do admission and funding in the same letter to you. Some separate it and it's two separate letters. All right, so what's Gainesville like and what's housing like? I don't live in Gainesville, so I'm gonna let some other people talk about this. So do any of our students and staff wanna talk about housing in Gainesville? Who wants to go? Yeah, I can start. Um, okay. So when I first moved to Gainesville, I actually lived in the continuum. So this is a, a place that uh, was pretty newly built and uh, dedicated to graduate students and um, certain working professionals at UF. Um, you know, if this is like, if you're moving to Gainesville from, you know, somewhere else, uh, you know, this is a nice place as sort of like a starter um, community because they do have a lot of different events that they hold, you know, for different graduate students, but also the fact that it comes fully furnished. And so, you know, you won't have to worry about buying furniture right when you move here and whatnot. So I thought it was a good idea, but then eventually I, I ended up moving out. So these are just two that are on here. There's no specific reason. There's lots of places in Gainesville. Um, do some others that uh, live in Gainesville want to talk? Or yeah, I can, I can definitely talk, Mike. Great, thank um, you. So I was a student here um, before I became a graduate staff member. So I lived here for 10 years now. Um, in my undergraduate, I lived on campus for a little bit, but then I, after a while, I moved off campus. And so there's a lot of off-campus housing options that I definitely recommend looking into. Um, and some of them are furnished, but some aren't. But there's Again, there's also a lot of used furniture stores or new furniture stores as well. Um, so it's just about exploring your different options, um, really. Yeah, and the city of Gainesville is pretty commutable, even if you don't live inside the city area. Um, there's also buses that you could use with your uh, Gator One, so you can get around pretty easily. And there's a lot of shopping centers as well. Yes, we have free busing on campus, so everyone can get around for that. There's lots of things to do, sports and otherwise here. Uh, maybe how about Hank Quinn or Min Chow? You wanna talk about some student life for new PhD students? Yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, 
for the UF housing. So uh, UF can provide some in housing dormitory and they are really uh, uh, they are cheaper than the housing that you can find in the gantry. So yeah, so I re I recommend the first thing you can you if you can come to the UF is to submit your in housing uh, application first. Yeah, so yeah, so for other life, uh, while uh, for the Gainesville, yeah, for the UF students, they usually go to Orlando or Tampa or Jacksonville to have fun. So yeah. Yeah. All right. So I so I recommend go go to other big city and they are much uh and they are they are more interesting than Gainesville. Gainesville is kind of like a college town. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Then Chow, did you have any uh fun things you like to do in Gainesville? Yeah, I can add to that on the previous slide about sports. So uh, um UF is big on football. Um, so a lot of student groups here, uh, for example, for um, mechanical and aerospace engineering department, MAE, um, our graduate student council would put together like tailgates on the weekend so that students could join in and then uh, go tailgating or go to the football games. And then besides from those uh, more um, organized events, um, student groups also have um, intramural sports team. So if you know if you're um, not into watching sports and you like to play sports, there are a lot of student groups who organize those intramural sports team that you could join. So I, I would say that uh, what drew me to UF when I was looking at school was the, uh, the, the life outside of lab. There are a lot of uh, student groups on campus who are organizing different things to do all the time, from sports to parties to um, uh, out of town trips. Uh, like to other places like Orlando and Tampa. So it's a great student life here, here, I would say. Okay, great, thank you. Christina, I know you always have a few great things to say about the area. So I'm actually a true Gainesvillian. That's a word I've created. Um, but I've lived here all my life. And yeah, like we go to St. Augustine, I'm an hour and a half from St. Augustine, Daytona Beach. You have, so you have the beach which is amazing. You have lakes, you have rivers, um, you have springs. There's so much to do. Yes, um, they're, they're putting up like Universal and Disney. There's just so, so much to do, so much downtown, so much to do if you have families. I know some of you have families. Um, we have Lake Wahlberg, which is a student run um, thing, uh, part, part of uh, uni the University of Florida. Lots of activities and stuff to do. Plenty of alligators to see. <laughs> Gainesville is just a unique place. I don't. I've been to many different places. And I don't know. Gainesville is just. Gainesville is where my heart is. I I love living here. I love how close. Like I said, I love how close you are. If you want to go to the beach or other things, so many things to do outside. Hiking, definitely trails, parks, na you know, nature parks. Um, things to do inside. It's just, it's just crazy. It's, it's almost like an Orlando on a smaller scale, but definitely better. And I'm a little biased, um, but, uh, but it's amazing living here. Great, thank you. So we only have about five minutes left and I'm big on finishing on time because I know all of you are busy and have lots of things going on. So here's some contact information uh, for some of those that were here that joined us today and some that were unable to Ashley, do you want to quickly give away maybe a couple more shirts? Sure. Um, let's see. Uh, Jaden Vap. We'll also do. Do any of the different colleges have anyone in particular they were wanting to give them to as well? Any the students? You mean? Mm -hmm. So are there a couple of the grad staff that were um, answering questions with someone in particular today you'd like to offer them a shirt?
You oh, you already said Jaden Bapp. I've been messaging with messaging him. So okay. Anyone else? We could do two or three more quick. I've been messaging with um, Chadubin. Don't want to say his name incorrectly, but um, if that's something that's possible to do, then I'm fine with that. Okay, so if your name is called, you want to send Ashley your address and um, shirt size. If you're in another country, I don't know if we're mailing overseas, but as soon as you're on campus, come see us and we'll take you into the bookstore and honor that. Anybody else quick? We could do um, Gaines Morrison. Okay. All right. All big winners of Gator shirts. Is there any final um, questions that I can try to answer now? Maybe something in the chat or if someone wanted to type a question in quick that has not been answered today? Any of our grad staff see something that needs to be reiterated that's been keeps coming up or? It looks like pretty much all the questions have been answered too. There's two questions getting answered now, but if anybody sees anything they wanna reiterate. Um, we got a question about going over housing options some more. Yeah, so, um, we have some links, uh, maybe we can send that, maybe I can send that out when I send the, uh, the website location of the slides. There's lots of um, housing options, apartments and home rentals and on-campus housing uh, in Gainesville and they're building lots of high rises now. Some are more undergraduate oriented and, and uh, um, graduate students kind of want to live in separate locations, but they're not limited to that. So I'll try to include some of that in the email I send out tomorrow. Okay, I think we're at time now. So um, thank you for all of your time today. I know that um, outstanding prospective PhD students have lots of options and there's lots of schools and universities that would love for you to come and enroll. So, uh, uh, we are happy that University of Florida is on your list, and we think uh, that you can help add um, to our campus, to our academics and our diversity, and we're glad you're considering. So uh, please stay in touch. Please submit your applications, and you have a whole panel of people uh, here today that are available all the time uh, to get back with you. And um, we look forward to receiving your app and then seeing you on campus for the spring visit. So thanks for your time today and uh, go Gators. Hey, Mike, yes. did you real quick, did you hit on somebody to ask that they came in late? I know you're recording the webinar. Are you going to send it out or where are you going to yeah. put that? So tomorrow yes. morning, I'm going to email everybody that intended and was invited with the website that has the recording and all the slides. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Ashley, for coordinating it, Mike. You okay. guys are awesome. All right. All right. Take care, everybody. Good night.